Although Pompeius Magnus had been consul alongside Crassus in 55 BC, and the law required ten years between consulships, in the face of so much political violence, the Senate turned to him, setting aside the law and asking him to accept the consulship for the 52 BC year. After Pompeius Magnus accepted the solo consulship early in 52 BC, the Senate's conservatives began to address controlling the violence within the city and the subject of Caesar. The Senate was divided over Caesar's war in Gaul. Many of his political opponents found the reasons given by Caesar for his actions following the migration of the Helvetii to be flimsy. Ariovistus was a friend and ally of the Roman people, and Senate conservatives considered Ariovistus's taking of a few tribal lands in free Gaul to be beyond the scope of Caesar's imperium within a land which did not belong to Rome. And so they blamed Caesar for attacking a Roman ally. Caesar's battles against the Nervii and other Belgic tribes, which he claimed necessary to protect himself, were in fact instigated by his own continued occupation of their lands. But when Caesar began indiscriminately massacring Gaelic citizens as punishment for defending their lands against an invasion that had no senatorial backing, Caesar's opponents sided with Gaul. The profits Caesar had amassed by selling Gaelic peoples into slavery, however, he'd invested in buying senatorial support from within his own reformist faction. Regardless of how much Senate conservatives howled about Caesar's illegal war, his paid supporters resolutely fought back, preventing the Senate's passing legislation which would end Caesar's illegal war and force his return home. In addition to division within the Senate, there was division in the streets, resulting in even more far-reaching violence. The gangs which had belonged to Publius Clodius, who was part of Caesar's reformist movement, were outraged over the murder of their leader. Rampaging throughout the city, they attacked and killed anyone they deemed a supporter of Milo, the leader of their rival gang. With the gang wars raging, Rome's streets were awash in blood. Because he had stolen command of the Eastern Campaign from Lucius Licinius Lucullus, Pompeius Magnus had at one time been the primary target of Cato and the Boni. But following the death of Marcus Licinius Crassus in Syria, the Boni came to realise that, without legions, they were not strong enough to take down either of the two remaining triumvirs. Deciding that it was better to maintain their voice in government than be pushed out altogether, the Boni chose to throw their support behind the devil they knew, so that Cato and his arch-conservatives could manipulate Pompeius Magnus into doing what they wanted, which was to bring Caesar down. Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, who was married to Cato's daughter and a die-hard Boni, made a motion that the Senate grant Pompeius Magnus the extraordinary powers of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum. As holder of this extraordinary command, Pompeius would be granted the authority to dictate whatever policies he deemed necessary to preserve Rome's Republic. And when the extraordinary command of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum expired, Pompeius could not be prosecuted for any decisions made under the auspices of that command. However, as the Senate made him this offer, Pompeius would have likely recalled the fate of Cicero, who, trusting in that same guarantee of protection under the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, had moved to halt a comparable civil war in its tracks, by sentencing to death without a trial those Roman citizens caught in the plot. Yet, far from being shielded from liability, Cicero found himself exiled from Rome five years later. And now, a Senate who had been too fickle and fearful to stand behind Cicero in defence of a decision they'd pushed into his lap was dangling before Pompeius Magnus the same proposition. Another member of the Boni, having learned from both Sulla and Caesar just how best to tempt Pompeius Magnus, offered the plebeium general an assurance that he would have their support. Because Pompeius Magnus was always able to be bought with an aristocratic bride, Metellus Scipio offered his daughter, Cornelia Metella left widowed by the brutal beheading of her husband, Publius Crassus, at the Battle of Carrhae. Early in 52 BC, the 54-year-old Pompeius Magnus married the 20-year-old Cornelia, signifying that his arrangement with Caesar and Caesar's reforms was officially at an end. Pompeius Magnus was back in the conservative camp where he had always belonged. 
With the votes of the Boni, as well as those of the moderate Conservatives who already supported Pompeius, the Senatus Consultum Ultimum passed. As soon as he had the authority to do so, Pompeius ordered the raising of a new army for patrolling the streets of Rome. With the passage of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, the city of Rome was now under military occupation. Soldiers marched the streets, battling the fighting gangs that still waged their war over the death of Publius Clodius. Within four weeks, Pompeius's legions put an end to the gang of violence. The streets were finally safe for the people to walk, even if those streets were now under military surveillance. But the outrage over the murder of Publius Clodius was not over. The fighting stopped, but under the cover of darkness, continued looting, vandalism and graffiti betrayed the feelings of Rome's people, angered over the fact that Publius Clodius's murderer had not been brought to trial. In order to appease the masses, Pompeius passed a new law regarding violence and charged Clodius's murderer, Titus Annius Milo, under the new legislation. Hoping to control the outcome of the trial and save Milo from condemnation while giving the supporters of Clodius the appearance of the due process they demanded, Pompeius handpicked the 51 members of the jury, as well as the judge. He packed the jury with conservatives who had been protected by Milo over the previous five years, and as judge he named Lucius Domitius Anabarbus, the arch-conservative brother-in-law of Cato. Again, Pompeius turned to Cicero, compelling him to defend Milo, alongside Marcus Caelius Rufus and Marcus Marcellus. Unfortunately, on the very first day of the trial, a witness named Gaius Corsinius Scola, by portraying Titus Annius Milo as a cold-blooded murderer, agitated the crowd of Clodius supporters into such an emotional frenzy that one of Milo's advocates, Marcus Marcellus, was terrified. As he tried to cross-examine the witness, Scola, the crowd booed, hissed and threatened him into silence. On the second day of the trial, Pompeius ordered armed guards to ensure the supporters of Clodius did not get out of hand. By the fifth and final day of the trial, Cicero, who had been threatened and intimidated by Clodius's people, broke down, unable to finish giving his speech. Because the people who admired Publius Clodius had engaged in outbursts, the threatening of witnesses, jurors, advocates and their families, the fear of that outright rioting made the jurors afraid to render any other verdict than what they knew the people wanted. On a vote of 38 to 13, Titus Annius Milo was convicted of the murder of Publius Clodius and exiled from Rome. After moving to Massilia, modern-day Marseille, his property was confiscated by the state and auctioned. Supporters of Publius Clodius capitalised on Milo's absence to continue prosecuting, first on charges of bribery and then for public violence. After the trial and exile of Milo, and the subsequent trials held against him in absentia, the city finally calmed down. The fighting in the streets stopped, and business as usual resumed. With the internal safety of the Republic restored, it was time for Pompeius Magnus to lay down the extraordinary emergency powers of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum. Before doing so, however, he used his office to name a co-consul as his partner in the consulship for the remaining five months left in the year, Pompeius Magnus named his new father-in-law, Metellus Scipio Nasica. Through Pompeius, Metellus Scipio and the Boni legislated several new conservative laws, including a new law which prohibited consular candidates from standing for election in absentia. This particular law was aimed at Caesar, whom they knew intended to run for the 49 BC consulship. Ratifying his illegal conquest of Gaul would be Caesar's top priority as consul. And Caesar, during his 59 BC consulship, had already proven that he wasn't above breaking the law to get what he wanted. In 59 BC, he had incited a public riot in order to prevent his co-consul from vetoing his land reform bill. Despite being injured during the riot, his co-consul, Bibulus, had managed to use his veto, which Caesar chose to ignore by nevertheless allowing the people to vote on it. Cato, who had opposed his land reform bill, Caesar had arrested and thrown into jail. Now with a new province to arrange and ten full legions, who needed to be paid and settled on land somewhere, the Boni did not want Caesar at the helm of government a second time. By passing the law forbidding his running for the consulship in absentia, Cato and the rest of the Boni meant to force Caesar into leaving his province and journeying to Rome to announce his consular candidacy. The moment he entered Rome, Caesar's imperium would expire 
and with Caesar reduced to the status of a private citizen, Cato could immediately prosecute him, for the crimes of passing illegal legislation in 59 BC, and for waging unsanctioned war against Gaul, Cato vowed he would bring Caesar down.